Hi, this is Jordan with Zenata Consulting. In this video, I'm going to go over tips and tricks for using Zoho Flow, which was taken from our June 2023 monthly tutorial series on Zoho Flow. If you find this video useful, please feel free to drop a like and subscribe here on YouTube. And if you have any questions, please feel free to leave a comment below here on YouTube or head over to club.zenata.com and drop questions in our forums there. We can go ahead and answer those questions for you on our weekly show, Azaz, which is Ask Zenata Anything About Zoho. Without further ado, let's hop into the video. I am cursed with the knowledge of all the things that go wrong in the world. And so I'd like to go over some tips and tricks for things that just commonly come back to my court from our own clients who I train on flow. They use it, they build some, and then they come back to me with sticking points that get them kind of spinning their wheels or frustrated or pulling out their hair. And I'm going to go ahead and piggyback off of Greg here, hop into the My CRM Flows folder that you saw him create in real time there. And I'm going to use the new form entry that we just built. And I'm going to start out with... One of my favorite parts about it as a former developer, which is the ability to create deluge functions inside of here as action blocks. You can certainly build things as you go on the fly. And a lot of times you will just be solving business use cases as they come up. But one thing I really love to do is pre-build some common things that I'm going to need right out the gate. And so what you can do is if you go into the logic section under this custom functions that Greg alluded to, you can create functions and they just become new action blocks that you can drag and drop. And the way that would work is for this example here, we've got format date as a custom function because we were formatting dates very often. If I hit the edit button, you'll see that it's taking in certain arguments. And if you're not familiar with Deluge, don't feel super overwhelmed here. I'm sure you have someone you can kind of delegate this out to, if not us. But you are basically taking in a date taking in a string that lets us know how to format the dates. So do we want it month, day, year? Do we want it day, month, year? How do we want this formatted? And then we've got some test variable that you can just ignore here. And then it takes in that data and pops out a formatted string in this case. So the idea here would be an action block where you say, I'm going to pass you in a lead ID and I'm going to do this with it. I'm going to pass in a date and then the function's going to do a bunch of things and pass me out a processed you know, product. Or it could even connect to APIs of other apps. If you wanted to create your own basic action block for, let's say there's a third party app that isn't connected with Flow, but you're going to be connecting it to Flow a lot. You could have code that's using the API of that third party tool to do something over there. And then you're just using that action block over and over. So anything you need to build, we recommend just building a very generic block is my tip. So don't make it super, super hyper specific to your use case. Try to make it generic where it takes in generically this piece of data. It's going to do something with it. And then it's going to pass out a useful piece of information rather than the function doing everything. So for example, if it was going to grab a deal and then grab a contact related to that deal so it can fetch the email. I mean, you could do all those with flow blocks that exist. But let's say for some reason you couldn't do that with a flow. And your goal was to send an email to that email address rather than sending the email inside of this action block, make it generic, make it just go in, grab that data you'd need and pass back the email address so that you can use the send email action block to send that email. Yes, as kind of what Greg just mentioned, that will use more task credits. It will use an extra action, but it keeps it more generic and reusable because the goal here, the nice thing will flow is it's drag and drop reusable. So you want to build your functions in that same vein. That's my biggest tip there. On that note, one of the ones I'm going to recommend you guys build has to do with this exact use case of forms to CRM. So unfortunately, while Zoho is one nice, great ecosystem, the reality is that different teams build the different apps inside of Zoho's system. So the Zoho forms team doesn't always communicate with the Zoho CRM team to make decisions. And what that ends up meaning is when forms did a couple different field types, mainly multi-selects and currency, they decided to handle currency values and multi-select values in a very certain way. Zoho CRM decided they had a different route. So if I was to have a form that had a bunch of financials, maybe you're asking your client to enter in a budget, for example, inside of this form. I'll even go ahead and see if there's any currency fields that we have in this form that Greg selected. Uh, it doesn't look like we do. But if they did, let's say it was your, your budget and it was just a currency field in forms. What forms will end up doing is it'll pass the dollar sign value along with that currency value. So it ends up giving you a, essentially what's called a string. It's no longer just dollar amounts. It's got 
characters, like special characters in it. And so if you tried to just take that currency value and pass it straight into CRM, CRM won't let you. It just won't. It'll say that it's an incorrect data type and it'll fail and you'll start to hit those error branches in your flow a bunch. So unfortunately, that is just, they just don't work well together. So what you'll have to do is create a little logic piece, a little small little Deluge function that takes in a currency value from forms and pops out a properly formatted number so that Zoho CRM can take that back into one of its currency fields. And the other one would be multi-select. So a drop down picker or a radio option where you can select more than one value inside of the form. Those need to be formatted in a very specific way for CRM to take them. It needs to be what's called a map or maybe it's a list of maps. I can't remember exactly. I honestly am not, it's been a lot of tests that I developed, but there's a very specific way that delusion needs to be formatted. So you would create a custom action here for taking in a multi-select value from a form formatting it the way you want, and then popping it out the other end so that you can then map it into your CRM update variable as an example. Custom functions are going to come in handy. You're definitely going to run into use cases where you need them. And the error that you would see, um, I'm not sure, I don't think Greg went over this, but in the history, when you're looking at history actions, you can actually dig into them a little bit deeper and see inputs and outputs. And if something fails, it'll actually tell you why it failed. So if you look at it and it tells you that it's an incorrect data type, you likely need to add some sort of custom function in there that will format the data the way you want, which kind of piggybacks into my next case. We used to do that a lot for dates, but you actually don't need to for date formatting anymore. So date formatting got a nice new little feature where if I'm in the builder and let's say I'm fetching a lead here and I'm creating this new, lead, this new contact. And as part of that new contact creation, I have a date field on the contact record that says, you know, date of first action or maybe date of last form entry or something like that. If I wanted to stamp that date field, sometimes the date that you get from system A isn't in the same format format that system B is expecting, especially when you're dealing with third-party apps. Let's say Shopify sends the format in one way, Zoho wants it in a different way. Conveniently now, if I'm filling out, let's say the closing date on this particular record, if I grab a date field, you'll see that this little blue option pops up on my screen for formatting date and time. So we used to have to do custom deluge for this, but now it's actually built in. It's a relatively new feature in Flow where I can click on this and I can convert the format to the format I want. So keep in mind that if you're ever having issues with dates coming through wrong, let's say your system is passing them in day, month, year, but then when you run a test, it's creating a record in Zoho that's all messy. It's like the wrong month and day. It's, it's kind of con it's flipping some values around. You likely just need to use this nice little format date and time to get the format the way you want it so that it doesn't error or doesn't pass data in incorrectly. The next thing I want to talk about as a tip is around these decision branches. So while Greg was building this with you guys, we have the CRM lead found, CRM lead not found. That's a pretty binary tree, but sometimes your trees are a little more complex than this. They'll have five or six options. So it's important to understand how these decision trees operate because I commonly have clients come back where they've got four or five decision checks and then they have actual data running through their flow and it doesn't take the branch they expected it to. And the reason is usually that they don't understand the way that it processes the tree. The way trees are processed is top down. So it'll always check condition one. If condition one is true, it's going down that path. It'll never even look at condition two, condition three, condition four. It exits the tree as soon as it's able to. So if CRM lead found was your first criteria and then your next criteria was CRM lead is a customer and that was supposed to be more important, it needs to be higher in the tree because if it finds the lead, it's done, it's, it's moving on. So you'll never hit CRM lead is customer because if it's a customer, it existed. So it's always going to hit existed. So you have to use the more exclusive ones first and then get more generic down your tree as you go. If none of those conditions are met, that's when it's going to go down this default branch. So if CRM lead was neither found nor not found, um, not possible in this case, but if these were conditions where it was like, is the lead a customer? Is the lead a, a vendor? Are they, you know, different things? And it turns out that lead was none of those things. It just wasn't tagged as any type. Then it would fall down into this default condition. So it kind of just goes top down, tries to find a, a statement that's true. And then if every single condition evaluates as false, then it will go down this default pathway with this little bubble here that's going in this case, nowhere right now. Really make sure you order your conditions in a way that makes sense. Um, another common example I have of that is if you've got a form where they might fill out one contact, but they might fill out five. And so you kind of want to start with the five at the top, right? Because if it's got all five of them, create everything. If it's only got four, then start part way down. If it's only got three, then only create contact three, two, and one. So you can kind of 
to have that trickle down in a branch. So you just got to go, you got to really think about how you're ordering these. Because unfortunately, you can't drag and drop these around within the tree. I don't think at least. You can only add new ones. So if you have the wrong, them in the wrong order, you have to kind of like recreate it. So you really want to think about it before you create these decisions and make sure that it's going to follow a logical flow. Um, if you need to use two decision trees in order to accomplish the flow you need, then do so. Like Greg said, you're going to use them a lot. The next item is properly naming in your flow. These ones that Greg built happen to be pretty clear. You know, convert lead to contact, create or update contact. But you will actually use uh, an action in Zoho CRM a lot that's called create or update module entry, which is just generically create or update something in CRM. And then inside of that action, you tell it what that something is. So I want to create or update you know, custom module A or custom module B or leads or contacts, whatever module. And if you end up with a complicated flow with 10 items on here and all of them just generically say create or update a thing, two months down the road when you come back because there's something wrong with this, it's very hard to remember what everything was doing and you have to kind of figure it out. So what you can do is if you hover over these, you can rename these to be more generic and it doesn't affect what it actually does in the slightest. So I could say, you know, instead of creating or updating contact or converting lead to contact, I could change this to convert existing lead, right? So that lets me know that what's happening here is there's an existing lead and it's being converted. That's what's happening right here. Whereas this one's creating or updating content. That's actually pretty straightforward, right? So I could leave that one. Um, send error email to Josh, right? Now I know that what this is doing at a glance is sending an error email to Josh, right? So just keeping things very clearly named while it's a little bit of extra work up front, I'm trying to help future you. <laughs> Just trust me, it's it's a pain when you're, someone comes to you and says, hey, this this didn't do what I wanted it to do. And you have to go trace it back and nothing is named well. You'll have no idea. You won't remember what you did three months ago. So just name it well. It'll be easier to read. Trust me, you will thank me. The next one I want to talk about is managing your connections. Um, so Greg did talk a little bit about connections. You saw him create a connection with forms. Uh, we also had a connection with CRM involved in this flow. Connections are user specific. So if I'm logged in as Jordan and I create a connection as Jordan, then it's it's basically accessing those apps as if it was me. So what that means is if I don't have permission to do a thing, neither does the automation anymore. So let's say you create the connection as Jordan and then later down the road in CRM, you decide that Jordan doesn't have permission to edit the email field. Jordan can only view the, edit, the, the email field. That will affect your flow. So just be very careful that your connections are built with a top level person who's not going to get restricted access because all of a sudden your flow will fail because this flow is set to update a contact, which is a mandatory field of email. And I'm not allowed to edit the email field. The flow is going to fail because Jordan's not supposed to be doing that. So you need to be very careful what, what user creates this connection. It should always be your super admin, your top level person, ideally something that's not even linked to a human. Um, when you're building out these flows, if you build them from like a Zoho admin at your domain.com type email address, then no matter how much employee turnover you have, these flows keep running because that user account is still there. The other thing to consider is your security. So sometimes your third party security team or someone internally will be like, we should cycle our passwords. We should you know, do all these things. Those are great security choices and you should, they are correct, but that will affect connections, including in Zoho flow. So if I was to change my password of this user account that built this flow that has the connection, and while I'm changing that password, I select the option to terminate all existing sessions. That can end up terminating your connections as well. So it's important to know what that what that's going to do and how to fix it if you know someone makes that mistake because we're all human. So if someone does that, what that means is that connections are going to break and you're going to start to see more of these errors. If you don't have error branches, you're going to start getting notified that your flow is erroring. And eventually, if it errors back to back too many times, Zoho will just shut your flow off to stop their servers from running these failures. One way or another, you're going to find out that this stopped working. When that happens, if you exit out of your flows here and go back to that main page where Greg is showing you in settings, if you go into settings and under your connections, sometimes it'll still seem like it's connected, but it won't actually be connected because you've broken that connection. And it's as simple as going to, let's say the forms connection, clicking this reconnect button, which will re-pop up a page to do the connection, reauthorize, you're good to go. Everything that was using that connection will now start working again. That's your simple fix. If you, if you break it, just go in and reconnect it. Um, so if you do have a, po a password change policy where you do have to change your password, you do have to terminate all sessions, that's fine. Just make sure that if it's on the account that you're using to do all these automations, go and just reconnect these. Even if they might already be fully connected, reauthorizing cannot hurt you. 
Um, so it's good to go ahead and reconnect all of these. What you don't want to do is just recreate new connections every time because then you have to go reset up your flows. It's, it's a whole hassle. You're better off just managing your connections here. The other thing you can do if something seems wonky, but you, you're so sure that your flow was built correctly, but it's still failing and you can't figure out why, you could go over and just hit the test button on the connection and it'll let you know that your connection is working fine or something's not right. Um, so checking your connections is a great place to go for debugging. And it's a place that people don't know to look and they don't know can break. So when people come to me and they're like, I didn't change anything, but all my flow is broken. I don't understand why. It's typically because there's a connection broken. And it's as simple as going through this page and debugging it. Lastly, another tip I want to go over is a bit of a user beware you know, tip where uh, don't click this button kind of tip. So inside of any particular flow, if I hop in here and I go into the builder, you will notice there's this little wand icon. And every once in a while, a client will stumble across this little guy. And if you hover over it, it'll give you this auto arrange. If you've got a really massive flow with you know 50 actions and multiple decision trees, it can get a bit a bit big. And this auto range feature boasts that it will consolidate it down into the page for you better and you know organize it into one nice clean looking thing. So you don't have, for example, crossing overlapping lines that so it's harder to trace, things like that. And for a very small flow, you know, if I really messed this one up and I hit that auto range button. Um, it'll it'll do a pretty good job at bringing it back to snap. The, the bigger your flow, the more likely that that button is going to make things so much worse than better. Um, I had a client who had this massive flow, 100, 200 different actions that it could take, a bunch of different paths, and it was getting a little messy. So they thought, I'm just going to click this button. My life is going to get better. And it just moved things everywhere that they shouldn't be. And then they had to sit there and manually clean up all of those connections, just kind of drag them into a nicer place so they could actually read their flow better. My advice here is just, just do it manually because on a, a small flow, it works well, but on a small flow, it also takes me all of five seconds to drag these boxes where I want them. You're either in a place where it's so simple that yes, that feature will work, but you could also just do it easier as a human, or it's starting to get more complicated and it's a good chance that it's going to make things worse instead of better. So I would just, you know, use this at your own peril, but if you use it, can't blame Jordan, can't blame, can't blame this guy because I warned you not to do that. There's one important tip, especially for all of you CRM users, which most of you, if you're using Flow, you're using CRM that we did not mention that we definitely should have. And that is triggering other automations based on these actions in Flow. So when you are in, let's say this creator update contact, if you scroll down to the very bottom of most of these actions, usually on the very bottom, I actually don't know where this one is. Let me just do a quick little search in my browser to find the word trigger which of course we used as the name of the thing. So it's going to show me everything. This one isn't. I think, oh, I think it might be on the creator update module entry. Okay. So let's, and I did mention that you're going to use this one a lot. It's actually my preferred. Uh, so default creator updates um, for different certain modules are great for the most part, but there's a more generic one that just generically works better. So I use it for everything, which is the creator update or the fetch of a module entry. So when you're doing those, let's say I'm creating or updating an, a module entry here. At the very bottom, you'll see a trigger option. So let's say I was creating or updating a contact in the standard layout. And I scroll on down. By default, it's set, going to be set to trigger all things. So you have workflows, blueprints, approvals, those types of things built in your CRM. It's going to trigger those. And you can choose not to if you don't want to. The reason I mentioned that is as Craig was talking about you know, the flows, I realized that one that you may come across with delays in queuing is recursive loops. If you set this flow to update a deal and this, this flow is set to trigger workflow rules, because that's where it will be by default. And then your, your thing that triggers this is a deal being updated in CRM. Then the deal gets updated. It triggers your flow. Flow updates the deal, which triggers the workflow again, which triggers another update to the deal. And you start just passing data back and forth. Uh, you don't want that. It will eat up your tasks very fast. You want to be a little bit mindful about what should and shouldn't trigger workflows. If there's a sequential thing that should happen after this, so flow is doing a thing and then CRM is going to have a workflow rule that naturally triggers as a next step, great, leave this on. If this should be an endpoint in this automation cycle, set this to none and nothing else will trigger off of it. It will just do what it's doing and stop there. A little bit of interruption, we can hop back to you know, me and Greg hanging out, but I just wanted to bring that one up because uh, while it doesn't happen often, if you set up a recursive loop, your credits will be gone for the month. Like, like that, it'll just, it'll, everything will just go wild. So be a little bit more mindful when you're updating those records to not trigger workflow rules that then trigger flow again.